Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, a show for HVAC professionals by HVAC professionals. The Metis Tech Show. It's so busy. All right, so we always start off talking about food. And no. All, yes. No. We well, that's what we do. And the three of us all came out of a van at some point. At some point, we were driving around in a van. And I think a large percentage of our audience is in that same boat. They're in a van Ooh. Going, from, yeah. going from job to job. So it just got me wondering and thinking about it and trying to remember what I used to do for lunch when I was on the road. Now, for me, I, I like leftovers cold. I never had to heat anything up. I'd have a sandwich. If I didn't bring one with me, I'd stop. You know, I'd stop at a, a store, one of those convenience stores that had the pre-made sandwiches, and I'd get an egg salad sandwich and a tuna salad sandwich, and I would just eat when I'd drive. I very seldom stopped to eat a meal. I'd just, you know, sit down and very seldom pulled it off to the side of the road. I usually just ate while I was driving. So that's me. So, Steve, what, have you done anything different or anything? Yeah, you unique? know, it, it's funny you bring that up because as service techs, as installers, we always ate horribly. On the road, right? <laughs> just no. if you weren't bringing something from home, you were stopping at McDonald's, you were yeah. stopping at Subway or something. And it was just never the most healthiest choice. But for a while there, in my single years, when I didn't have much money, <laughs> um, a can of Chef Boyardee, and I would have my can opener, just open it up. And how was I going to heat that up with a turbo torch? That's brilliant. <laughs> that really is brilliant. A pair of vice grips because the can gets hot. So you take the label off the can, you pair of vice grips, you hold the edge of it, and just you don't want to have the torch right on it, but just slightly warm it up. It starts bubbling, mixing it around a little bit, and you can get it. You know, oh yeah, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Spaghettios, yep, right, raviolis. I don't, I don't um, know what that stuff has in it. Spaghetti. That, that I don't. Sometimes. I haven't had it in probably twenty years. Beefaroni. Do you like the beefaroni? Oh, Those are my beef favorite. Beefaroni. Yeah, those oh, are yeah. the best. But that was, I would just grab a can of Chef Boyardee out of the cabinet in the morning, throw it in a lunchbox with some drinks, and I'd plan on warming it up with a I couldn't eat that cold. It no. wasn't happening. Yeah, I could. I like cold Italian food. I don't know why it's just me. But if I have lasagna or spaghetti or anything Italian like that, it's in the fridge. It's left. I mean it cold. I don't heat it up ever. No, I can't do that. Did you listen. just call SpaghettiOs Italian food? Well, <laughs> Chef Boyardee, <laughs> Chef Boyardee is a real person who was Italian. He immigrated to New York City and started this company. So yes, you'd have to consider that sure. Italian food. Now I know right now thousands of Italians are rolling over in their grave, <laughs> but technically speaking, that's Italian food. Sure. How about you, Bryn? What have you done? Uh, so I had a lunchbox that you could plug in to the car lighter in the van. Are you serious? Yeah. So just heat up the food while I worked in the morning. And then by the time lunchtime came around, all my food was warm. That's crazy. That's great. I never heard of a These young guys. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Modern technology. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, probably, wore glo- <clears throat> probably wore gloves and long sleeves to do insulation. <laughs> I have seen some technicians that they had an inverter in the truck or something, and they, they have a microwave in yep. there. and. Uh, I, I come from the days of paper maps yep. and beepers, right? Or the old brick phone. Those yeah. are the, those are the, those are my days. So I'm dating yeah. myself now. But that, <laughs> no. The only time I ever sat down to have a meal uh, was when we were like on a job all day, like you're roughing in ductwork and piping on new construction. You know, I was just talking about it before we we came on the air, and uh, it was one time, you know. Living, what was going to be the, the living rooms where people had tables yeah, set up, the yeah. plans were there, and everybody put their lunches there. We're up in the attic putting in the ductwork and getting everything ready, and everybody comes down to lunch, and there's shredded paper lunch bags all over the floor. Some dog from down the street came over and oh. just took everybody's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had, a, he had a blast. No food for you. No food for you. No. dog took it all. That was the same job site where there was a plumber there, and... Uh, it was a different day, but he was uh, he was drinking a Coke. He put his can down. He's eating. He's talking. Uh, 
he he grabbed his can, took a sip, and there was a bee that got inside the can. It bit that him happened up, to me. Bit him on the mouth. Yep. This guy swelled up like you wouldn't believe. I mean, his eyes swelled shut, his nostrils, he could hardly breathe. And uh, his coworker I had to rush him to the hospital. We didn't see him again for a few days. Yeah, that happened mm-hmm. to me while I was driving. I almost drove off the road. <laughs> That's not fun. Yeah, swollen lip, no fun at all. The best jobs that I'd been on as a service tech, as, a, as an installer, is when you had that awesome customer mm. that would cook you something. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I felt there was only a handful, you know, a few of those people that out there that did that. It was usually the um, older people. For me, it was the elderly people who would do that for you. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, you know, full, cooking you steaks. Like, you can't go back to work after. It was like, yeah. you know, stop feeding me There's so much food. It was it was excellent. Yeah. Um, the customers that actually take care of the techs out in the field and ask you if you want something to drink, so want something to eat, or they just make you something and you got to eat it. Yeah. Right? I remember one time we were doing a furnace change out, me and a, a guy named Dan, and we're in the basement. It's an old house, probably built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We're getting rid of the big green Williamson furnace, you know, one of the big gas yeah. chamber. Uh, no thermocouple, just a pilot, you know, in a quarter-inch tube coming off the gas valve, and we're putting in a 90% efficient. And we were there, and this lady was an old Portuguese lady, and she, you know, she spoke Portuguese, no English, and she calls me upstairs. And she goes, Paulo, Paulo, venka. You know, she's telling me, come here. I go upstairs, and the table's all full of food. I'm thinking she's having yeah. lunch for her family. Yeah. And she goes, oh, go tell your coworker to come up and eat. And I said, oh, it'll look good. I mean, it would look, it smell wonderful. So I go down and get Dan and go, Dan, uh, she wants us to go up and eat. And he says, I brought my lunch. I go, well, throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we're not yep. turning this down. Let's go. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah, that it, it was so going good. back home. Yeah. I actually had that happen one time because uh, I know sign language. So I got to a customer's house. Both the husband and the wife were deaf. So as soon as I noticed, I started using sign language with them. We had a conversation. When I got done with my job, I went upstairs, and they had made me and my partner sandwiches. So we sat down. It was the quietest lunch I've ever had, but we had a great conversation the whole time. Yeah, it's cool. Great. You, you know started language? using sign language? Yeah. So I know sign language. So what? Like, yeah. American so it was just kind of cool. Sure. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It was like a cool little yeah. experience. I just started kind of chatting with him downstairs. And then next thing I know, he had sandwiches made for us. So we went up and sat at the table and had a whole conversation in silence. So what you're saying is the next time we make e-learning videos, we can have you in the little circle yeah. in the corner. <laughs> you know, uh, look doing at the that. sign language thing. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. Amazing. Yeah. The things you learn. Yeah. Wow. Just learn something new about Bryn. <laughs> Pretty cool. You know, so, uh, there was another customer. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but there was another customer. I, had, I, I might have brought these people up before. Uh, there were the older couple in that school that I had to keep adding, to convert it to condos. I had to keep adding R22 into the system. And uh, they gave me something that was like a lobster Newberg or something. It was lobster. And they just bring it up. It's like, it was so rich and so good. But that was probably the best meal anybody ever cooked mm. for me. But that was wicked good, too. I'm going to give you another one. When I first started in this trade, I was actually still in high school and working on co-op. My first job in refrigeration was working on fishing boats. Hmm. Was, I learned so much, but it was the most terrible job I've ever had going on some of these fishing boats. And I remember working until midnight because we were just the time that we had to go, we were able to work on this boat. And we were so hungry. And my boss went out without telling anybody, and he just bought a whole bunch of McDonald's cheeseburgers yeah. and French fries and everything and brought it to all the guys. I'll tell you, that I, that sticks in my head as probably some of the best food, and it really is not the best food. No. But food. at that time, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we were so hungry. We were working all day, and just that little bit of you know gratitude, showing up on the job and giving us all that food. No. Yeah. I was on vacation last week, as you guys know, and I told you about the dairy farm my cousin out in California runs, you know, 300 head of cattle, and he was tell, telling me all these cows. We, I showed you the video. I actually saw a calf being born. Yeah. It, was it was awful. Horrifying. It was, it was horrifying. It was. It was awful. Just not natural. Uh, and he, I asked him, what happens to the cows when they get too old and not producing milk? He goes, McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they go to McDonald's. I guess cows like McDonald's too, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So at all all of our listeners out there, if you have a, a unique story of being on the road as a service tech, as an installer, um, what you had to do to get some grub, get yeah. some food on the road. We've all had, you know, been there and, and, and had to stop at a, a fast food joint or 
brought something from home to eat, um, email us at Metis Tech Show. What's our website? <laughs> What's our email address? <laughs> It is Metis Tech Show at HVAC.MEA.com. Awesome. Yeah, well, we never email us. You can also send us uh, fan mail through Buzzsprout. Right. So the fan mail. So we're going to take some time in this episode, and we're going to talk about fan mail and some of the things that we've gotten. So the fan mail is a feature uh, that you can go right on your phone when you're listening to the podcast, and you can hit a little link that says send us fan mail, and it's like a text that we get. It comes to our computer. It comes to our app we have for um, the hosting company that hosts our, our podcast. And we started in June, and then there was an episode I wasn't on. I was on a bunch of episodes, and there was just one I wasn't on. And there's a <laughs> bunch of people started sending us this fan mail. Through I these saw texts that. I noticed yeah. that. Yeah. About, hey, great episode, but why wasn't Paul on it? Did he finally have a heart attack and die? Well, yeah, and, some of them were pretty bad. You know, I like the show. It was nice not having Paul interrupting everyone, you know. Yeah. Um, why, where is Paul? I like his humor. Uh, this was a very good episode, very technical, probably why Paul wasn't on, way over his head. You know, I miss <laughs> Paul on this one. Where is Paul? He's yeah. very smart and witty. I hope he's on the next one. I'm glad Paul wasn't on this one. He's not that smart. Um, I was really concerned with the negative comments, and then I was noticing that half of them came from Georgia and half of them came from, from the Boston area. And it was just a coincidence that you were in Georgia um, that same day and, and back in Boston no, that same day. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I would not. I would not do this to myself. Uh, uh, they all came from different numbers. Yes. So we don't get the phone numbers. Just so everybody knows when you do that, we only get the last four digits of the phone number. We don't get the whole number. And we cannot reply to them, so we can't text you back. I don't know why we don't have that ability. But, well, let's move on to the, the real uh, fan mail text that we got. Uh, so somebody from Atlanta, Georgia said one of the best piping practices. No, I'm sorry. On the best piping practices show, Paul said there are flaring tools that are idiot proof. I think he meant idiot resistant. Yeah, oh, that's well. a good one. That's a good one. That's yeah. probably correct. You know. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, and then Nick. Every time we have an episode, Nick in Hawaii, we had him on, yeah, the, on the show. We appreciate great it. Great guy. I love yeah. Nick. He's a great guy. Good, good tech. He said, good episode, guys. I wonder who would win in a heads-up match of Mitsubishi equipment knowledge jeopardy between Bryn and Scott. That would be one. I, we, should, we should create a jeopardy, like highly technical jeopardy or a, and have a contest and see which one of them. But you got to put, you know, all the guys are up there, not just, um, you know, Bryn and Scott are wicked smart, but yeah. a, we got a good team. They know their stuff. Yeah, I actually, um, I reached out to Scott when I saw this fan mail come in. And I told him, like, already concede. I'm like, no, if there's any controls questions, you've got that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. a whole category that he'd, he'd kick my butt in. So, And then I think it was the last episode that we did towards the end. I wasn't on it, but I was listening to it. Uh, and Juan was making a comment about HVAC. You know, there's no fire at HVAC. And I think guys that do <laughs> oil and gas are like, what the heck is he talking about? Yeah. So somebody from Cincinnati, Ohio uh, said, Juan... What does the H stand for in HVAC? Yeah, when I seen that, I, I had to go back in the episode and find out what he was talking about because I missed that. Yeah. It totally went over my head. And, yeah, one, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Some of the emails uh, that we've gotten um, from Nick. Again, hey, it's me again. Just wanted to say I really enjoyed the most recent episode. Our two systems are a bit of an enigma to me since we never – install or work on them out here but i loved hearing Bryn go into detail on the refrigerant flow he really knows his stuff anyway thanks for keeping me company on the van on the way home during these late work days and the heat of the summer it makes uh, a long hard day just a little bit more tolerable so that must have me referring to the episode you did you went through yeah we talked specific. about yeah each uh, component in the r2 system yeah. yeah, so I don't know if you mentioned, Paul, Nick is from Hawaii, and I forget about that a lot, that our two systems aren't used everywhere, yeah. right? Um, I taught a class down in Miami uh, to a bunch of people from the islands, and they were looking at me like I had two heads, and I, I you know, I was trying to, and they, and they were like, we don't install our two systems. It's Y-series, it's a heat pump, and it's cooling all year. Yeah. So I, I never thought of that. I remember doing a class for a bunch of guys in Aruba, 
And um, there was a slide in the old presentation that had the hoods that go in the city multi, you know, for cold weather. Yeah. And the one that comes with a motor for the dampers and one that doesn't. And they buy the one without the motor. I go, in Aruba, why would you buy this in Aruba? It's because of the coconuts. (laughs) The coconuts fall (laughs) out of these trees. What? Those coconuts are 50, 60 feet, the trees. You know, they're up Mm. there. These coconuts fall. They said, yeah, Yeah. it damages the equipment. So they put those winter hoods on there. And a low Uh, ambient kit. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, we got another, see, um, we had a very good episode with Ed Blair talking about Kenza Cloud. Yep. And and I think it was Nick again, you know, he said, I, I, I can't wait uh, to install one of these and sell one of these. He asked a couple of questions and Ed responded back to him. He says, does the RMD50A have wireless in- internet Wi-Fi capability? And uh, um, Ed's answer was, it's Ethernet only, static IP or DHCP. When we need remote or wireless connectivity in our group, we use Cradle Point cellular routers. This would also make it a good startup tool on a system that doesn't have a working network yet. So that's that's mm. something good to know. Uh, he asked what manual will get the information in. And of course, it's the AE200 manual. You can also find it in the PAC-SC51KUA manual. Uh, and he provided copies of that. Um, and he said, let's see, lastly, Steve mentioned the commercial controls class. Is this a course that you guys already offer? If not, do you know when you might start? Will Kenza Cloud be discussed in the City Multi Essentials class in Swanee in December? So that's a very good question. So yeah. we do have a commercial controls class, but we put it on pause because we need some updating for that class, and Kenza Cloud is probably going to be part of it. We probably will touch on Kenza Cloud in the City Multi Essentials class, but we don't really get too deep into the controls there, but that's uh, right. that's in the plan. Let's see. The last thing he says, I also wanted to mention that I, too, am a fan of the reverse sear method of cooking steaks, and I, I have yet to try this. I'm going to try this with my, my grill and my griddle. Uh, let's see. In fact, I just cooked four two-inch thick New York strips this past weekend on my Pit Boss grill using that method. It works great, and don't I don't think I'll ever cook a steak any other way again. The trick is to make a foil boat for the steaks to sit in on the grill so that you don't lose the juices during the slow cook. Pour that over them just before you sear at the end at the end and baste with some butter and rosemary and you'll be in steak heaven. That sounds delicious. It does. And I like the picture he put, you know, we're an audio show, you can't see the picture, but it's Hulk Hogan pointing his finger, you know, big Hulkamaniac. Reverse sear. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nice impression. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's good. I love I love the Hulkster. Uh, I'm more of a macho man, Randy Savage. Ooh, yeah. yeah. You well, know, it's I've cooked a, a gazillion steaks in my life, and it just drives me nuts because it never as good as when you get it at a night at a, at a restaurant. Mm. And I think it has a lot to do with the type of grill they use and the type could of be. meat too, and a type of meat exactly like a pork chop. Yeah, I can't. I, I don't know. I, I just, refuse to eat pork chops. I seem to dry the things out, and <laughs> but when I get one at my favorite restaurant, it's moist and and no. tender, and mm. I'm like, what? And, and, I, and I can tell it's a different cut. It's a different yeah. cut than what I'm getting at the supermarket. I'm not going to try pork chops. When I was a kid, my mother made pork chops. It was like shoe leather. It was like the soles of shoes. You just took them off the shoes and, and put them in a pan. It was just yeah. awful dry. So. All right, here we go again, talking about food. All right, okay. back on track. <laughs> so uh, Karen McGonagall, uh, she's actually one of our business unit uh, sales manager in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, she sent us a link for a very good article on HVAC podcast that came out of the yeah. Washington yep. Post, Sunday paper in the Washington Post. So it was a very good article, talked a lot about HVAC school and Brian Orr and the stuff that he yeah, does. Yeah, Brian, Brian Orr, I've been listening to uh, to him since 2016. Yeah, I love uh, his and show. I remember listening to his first. He was probably about five or six episodes in, and um, he started. One of the first episodes he did was with his kids, and his kids at the time I think were like maybe six or seven, eight years old, and they talked about basic electricity <laughs> on that. And I remember that episode. And I fast forward to a couple of years ago, I seen him at the AHR show in uh, in Atlanta. And I went up to his booth, started talking to him, and I said, I remember listening to your first episode, uh, one of your first episodes with your kids. And he said, yeah, that's my son right over there. And he pointed to his son, and his son's now 
it working in the field. Wow. wow. Uh, so pretty cool. He's like, got a good podcast. I think yeah. of all the HVAC podcasts, he's by far my favorite. And I listen to him. I don't listen to every episode. I, I kind of selective if it's something I, yeah. I'm interested in, I hear. But I do like who he has on. He's, and, you know, and, and the thing about him, and I, and I think we try to do this too, is we care we care that that technicians get the right knowledge and he cares about that too yeah you know our our industry are the techs in our industry have a bad rap because a lot of us have learned the wrong things to do and we continue to teach other the wrong you know others the wrong thing to do and it's just yeah. big snowball thing but you know he believes you know in doing it right you know the right tools, the right training. So, so I admire that about him. And there's there's other podcasts I listen to that are HVAC related too. But again, and, and obviously Brian friend. owns Kalos, um, and he he. I, what I love about Brian is he trains all of his technicians. They have their own little classroom. Uh, whenever he does a podcast, you can go and find the information he talked about, diagrams and and pictorials and videos on his website and that's huge i just wish we had the time to do yeah, that we, we don't. just don't this is this is something we but, do on, on the side it's not our full time i don't know where he gets the time he must sleep three hours a day so cool <laughs> kudos to brian or we're gonna get ralph wolf because uh, ralph's good friends with him we're gonna get ralph wolf um to pull him in yeah we'll get him show. on the show we'll get him on the show he can he can show us how little we really know yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah so the last email i want to i want to uh, finish with here and, and by the way, if if you're out there again, be, we'd we'd be happy. I would love to do an episode, nothing but emails on technical questions. But we would need to get enough emails to do a show on that. So, please send us your technical questions to metastechshow at hvac.mea.com, or and when you're on your phone and you see the episode, if you're listening to it, you know, click on the link that says send us fan mail and just text it to us. But I want to talk about uh, Patrick from Rhode Island. He he did the email, and we didn't respond to him right away, so he sent us in fan mail as well, pretty much the same thing. So he's got an MXZ330 installed, and he's got an MSZ09, uh, uh, two of them actually, and a PEAD15. He installed it in 2020. He's got an MHK2 on the 15. The PEAD. So I'll just read the email here and then throw it to you guys. So it said, I installed this system at my cousin's house. The ducted unit is not reducing temperature nor removing humidity when the two wall units are also on. If the ducted unit is on by itself, there is no problem conditioning the space. The charge is correct. There are no leaks. I did change the outdoor board because I was told there was firmware revision in the newer boards. This unit is in the attic. The attic is insulated. The duct is insulated with 3-inch R8 duct wrap. The unit has a layer of duct wrap on it also. The house has been installed and air sealed. Manual J was done. I would love to hear your discussion about this product. And before we, before you guys you know, tackle this, I just want to mention one thing. We are not the proper people to contact for tech support. Yeah. Right? It's your DSG first, and then we have an 800 number for tech support if you can't get your DSGs. But I thought this email was interesting enough that we could kind of go through some of the things that we should be looking for, um, or he should be looking for, and some advice that we can give him. Yeah. And I agree with him. I think it's a good discussion for us to have. So so where do we start with this? So, Bryn, um, you, you took a look at this. We were talking about this earlier, and you mentioned – um, that he's 3,000 BTUs overconnected. Yeah. So he's got what looks like two wall mounts, each 9,000 BTUs, and then a 15,000 BTU ceiling concealed ducted unit. So if you add up the capacity of the indoor units, you're at 33,000 BTUs for a 30,000. So we do allow for a connection up to 130% of our outdoor unit capacity, uh, but that does – doesn't come without a cost, right? We are not magically making up that last 3,000 right. BTUs. We are allowed to do that because of partial load conditions where you may not need all of them running at full capacity. But you, believe it or not, even up here in the Northeast, I mean, when it's really hot out, it's 95 degrees, high humidity, you probably will need 100% capacity of all those units. So if you've got 33,000 connected to a 30,000 BTU outdoor unit, you're going to have reduced capacity out of each of those units. Yeah, the max you're going to get out of a 30,000 BTU unit is 30,000 30, BTUs. BTUs. Again, it's for when there's it's for when you don't need it all at the same time. Right. right. 
what else can we what else can should we be looking at so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with uh uh some some people in 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 Swanee, Georgia, yeah. about making sure their static pressure is set correctly yeah. on on systems. That's so important. But not only that, but um, duct work. Having um, you know, our our ducted units are very low static units. Mm-hmm. Um, I think point six is the max you're going to get out of this one. Yeah, and so we got to make sure that our duct work is is all nice round turns. There isn't a ton of flex connected to it. Right, it should be all hard pipe. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not going to be th- making sure we're not throwing 150 feet of ductwork on a small yeah. ducted unit. They, you know, obviously, I'm sure th- that's not the case here, but things to, to consider. Also, everything that you add to that ductwork is going to create a pressure loss, right? So if we put in a f- filter, mm-hmm. right, that's a very high MERV rating. It's restricting a lot of air. Right, uh, things to look at. I don't know what type of filter are they using on this system. Even the types of registers and diffusers or whatever they're using, that that's going to make a big difference too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It all plays a role. I actually had a very, very, very similar uh, call when I was in a van where there was two wall mounts and a pancake unit in the attic, and the pancake unit wasn't satisfied. It was feeding three bedrooms, and uh, it wasn't a Mitsubishi product, but similar symptoms where that one pancake unit would not satisfy the area. And, you know, I spent a lot of time there and knowing now, like if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have changed the application a little bit only because it was tons of flex duct. So that whole place was that whole uh, pancake unit was piped in, in flex duct. Uh, None of us took an external static on that to see what type of static pressure was even on the system and comparing that against what the specs are for that unit. I mean, there's a million things you can go into to make sure that that pancake unit is going to actually be able to provide the airflow needed for that space. Um, There was limited return. That's another thing you got to pay attention to where your returns are and do you have anywhere for that air to go. Um, In our case, we didn't add a filter box, but if you do add a third-party filter, then you definitely need to take an external static to include that filter to make sure that you're going to be able to overcome that restriction. So there's a lot to it when it comes to the ductwork. You got to make sure that your ductwork is solid. Uh, you can't just slap a bunch of flex duct and cross your and fingers. And sealed. Yeah. Sealed is huge. Now make sure everything is sealed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and he did the right thing. He insulated it. You know, I don't know what the attic is, is like. It's probably an unconditioned space. So he yeah. did insulate it. Even insulated the unit itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We actually found out that uh, that particular pancake unit was not secured very well because some insulation was falling into the bedroom. And so we went and checked the diffusers, and those diffuse the flux ducts was just kind of resting on the diffusers uh, instead of being secured, yeah. and all those things play a role. You're going to lose capacity. Now we we had an episode um, a while back where we talked about uh, most important dip switches on a system, mm. and one of those dip switches we talked about was on a smart multi branch box, which is not what this system is, but it's the same idea. There is a uh, dip switch that a lower evaporator temperature. And if we, if we again, go into your service manual and look at the parameters for what temperature you're going to change it to, and a lot of you right off the bat are going to ask, well, why isn't that on right from the get-go? Well, we've said it before, right? It, the systems come from the factory at the highest efficiency, highest sear. You may not need that dip switch to be turned on, mm-hmm. and depending on location you are, uh, you know, weather, right? Where, where you're located, um, climate. But in this case, you might want to take a look. Um, and in your particular unit, it's it's dip switch uh, SW2-3. That'll lower your evap temp- temperature by a few degrees. And again, I'm just throwing um, the temperature out. I don't know what it is. Look in the service manual to see what it's going to turn to um, bring that evaporated temperature down to. And that's going to help that ducted unit tremendously. Especially when you have ducted uh, ducted units, you want to make sure you lower your evaporator temperature. So take a look at that SW two three, and that's in the outdoor unit, right? Yeah, that's in the outdoor right. unit. P series units have them, uh, and again, select models have that dip switch that that function um, to lower evaporator temperature. And I and we're not saying go out to every job you install <laughs> now and flip that dip switch on, right. but if it's a problem uh, where you're not removing humidity, it seems like you're just not cooling the space give it a shot yeah right? yeah and looking up the outdoor unit service manual for this particular model by turning that dip switch 2-3 on we'll start targeting a 44.6 degree yeah. coil 
and this is an MXZ 3C 0NA2U1. So this is the port style multi-zone unit, non-branch box. So yeah. again, that dip switch is specific to this unit. Don't flip that dip switch unless you're working on this unit. Yeah, yeah. that could be bad, right? <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back to the, the static pressure. Now, he said he has an MHK2 on the on the PEAD, the 15,000 BTU unit. How does he go about checking or adjusting the static pressure in this unit? Well, first, you're going to want to take the external static. Correct. So yeah. uh, you're going to need a manometer. You're going to need to make a small hole in your ductwork on the supply and return. If you added a third-party filter, you need to include that filter as part of your measurement. Um, and then external static is an absolute value, which means if you put your manometer in your return and you say, let's say you have negative 0 0.02 uh, inches of water column, and then your supply is 0 0.05, your st ex total external, ex external static is 0 0.07. So it's an absolute value. You get rid of that negative. You just add the two numbers together. That gives you your external static. So once you know that, then you can take that to your service manual to figure out exactly what you need to do to set that up. Now – um, if you give me a minute, I will look up. There's function settings. Right. So we can go to a controller and set a functions, and that's in an episode that we will be releasing um, soon on function settings. Listen for that. And uh, also you can uh, go to mylinkdrive.com and check out application notes, function settings, and you can find out the function setting number for setting the static pressure through the controller. Actually, by the time this episode goes on the air, that episode with customizing the function settings will already have been good out there. So what Steve yeah. just said is going to happen has already happened. So <laughs> wow. Get in it's your like, way back machine. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like back to the yeah. future. Yeah. Yeah. So with a PEAD, which is the unit we have in question here, you're going to take your external static like I just discussed. And modes 8 and 10 are how we're actually going to set yes. that system for an external static. So let's say you take your... External static, and you get point two. Mode eight would be in mode in setting three. Mode ten would be in setting one, and that's going to give you that point two static. And that's all that's doing is just adjusting the overall airflow from low speed to high speed. It's going to be able to maintain that airflow over that point two uh, external static. And like I said, you've got f what six total options here, as little as point one four for an external static, and then all the way up to point six. So if you're having issues and you take your external static and you've got a point four inches of water column for your uh, external static, you check the default setting is for 0.2. So anything above 0.2, you should be changing modes 8 and 10 on that MHK2 controller to be able to overcome that external static. All right. That's a good one. Excellent. Yep. All right. Now, there's um, a couple of other things you can do, at least one that I can think of. Bryn, you were talking about this earlier. Yeah, it's actually – so part of that um, question that he sent in was he mentioned that he had done a manual J, which is awesome. So manual J is essentially a load calculation. So he did a load calculation for the space, figure out the sizing, which is awesome. One of the last steps you're going to want to do, uh, if you haven't already, is just make sure that you put the build into DSB. So if you do a load calculation on a room and you get you know 15,000 BTUs, and you say, okay, I've got 15,000 BTUs of load on this particular space, so I'm going to put a 15,000 BTU unit in. It may or may not actually, that unit may or may not actually put out 15,000 BTUs. And the reason for that is what we call D-rate. It's dependent on the design conditions. Where is this being installed? Uh, how much total capacity is on that system? In this case, we're over capacity. So we're already starting to tax the overall output. Um, but yeah, even conditions. So I actually built a simulated version uh, of that build in DSB. And with those two 9,000 BTU heads and a 15,000 BTU ceiling concealed ducted unit, in Providence, Rhode Island, you would get 13,000 BTUs in cooling out of that head. And you guess, because the D-rate uh, is changes depending on how much pipe length you had. And you guess Correct. at the pipe length. Correct. I think you guessed about 30 feet or something like that. Yeah, about 30 feet. And I assumed it's probably in the attic, so I did about 15 feet for vertical separation. All right. So if there's more piping, you're going to D-rate even more if Correct. there's less obvious. So, so a good thing that you could do, Patrick, is to do an ASBIL. Take DSB and build that system. Use actual pipe lengths. Use how many 90s you should put in. They use the vertical separation. Uh, use a location as Rhode, Rhode Island or the nearest city. Uh, it'll let you select it. And then look at your outputs. Yeah. It'll tell you in BTUs, your BTU output for heating and cooling, 
assuming everything's running at the same time under those design conditions. So that is a pretty good tool to use. Actually, I like to use that for troubleshooting. You can actually select an option where you can actually see the discharge temperatures, what they will be, uh, both in heating and in cooling. So that's, that's yeah. a good tool to use. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do your indoor units derate? All indoor, all <laughs> evaporator coils and Every refrigeration. HVAC, yeah. refrigeration, walk-in coolers it will derate at mm-hmm. some point, and it has a lot to do, like you said, design conditions, line length. So yep. keep that in mind. You yeah. know what's awesome about DSB is it actually tells you what the derate is from. So in your quick results, there's this thing called correction factors, and it will say outdoor unit capacity and how much D-rate you get from that, the temperature and how much D-rate you get from that, piping length, defrost, and user D-rate, and then it will give you a total D-rate number. Wow, so it actually cool. will factor in, given all of your circumstances, this is why you're D-rating, and it gives actually kind of an idea of why you get that D-rate and where it comes from. Nice. So, And believe it or not, um, just out of curiosity, I built this system – same ported outdoor unit, but with just the ceiling concealed ducted unit on it. If you have about 30 feet of line set, you're still only at about 14 and change for BTU output. So even if just that one is running, you're still not going to get the full 15. So if that room is calling for 15, you're still about 1,000 BTUs less. Just an interesting uh, side there. All right. Yeah. That's good. So is there anything else we can tell Patrick that will help out? Um, get, a, get a hold of your DSG if you 100%. haven't already. and yeah. or yeah. Um, reach out to tech support and see if they can help you out. Yeah, Patrick. So if you try some of the things that we mentioned and you still get nowhere, then yeah, your DSG, who'd you buy your equipment from? They probably have a DSG member, the Diamond Service Group, or we have the 800 number, which I don't have memorized, so I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> yeah, and here at Mitsubishi, we love to use acronyms. So if you're wondering what a DSG is, that's your distributor, who you right. bought your yeah. equipment from. And what is DSB? DSB is Diamond System. System Builder, right? And we get that from my link drive. It's free software on um, on mylinkdrive.com. Yep. Right. Another thing, I get this all the time in class is folks who have, you know, bring their real-world problems to class and want to ask. And I always tell them, like, I'm not the best person to ask because I'm an instructor, which means I can tell you really, really well how things are supposed to work. But if you get in touch with your DSGs or an area service manager even, they know what it's actually happening in the field. They have a lot more hands-on. They've probably seen that problem before and know exactly how to fix it. We, being instructors, you know, we like to make site visits and we will, you know, we've all been in van- vans before. So we know the basics. But in reality, those are the guys to go to because those are the ones that are handling those calls every single day. Whereas we kind of talk more theory. This is how things are supposed to work, how they're designed to work. Yeah. Right. Those Good who point. can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in our case, it's those who did teach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is that is very well put. So I think that's it uh, for Patrick's email. There were a few others. Uh, I meant to read these uh, before we went on, but uh, we'll do it now. So this is another one from Nick. This is about the Mac 333 and 334 episode. He goes, what a fantastic episode. Seriously, guys, it's almost like you read my mind. The Mac 333 and 334 has been something of a mystery to me since I first saw it about eight years ago. It was implemented for a door switch system, but I remember thinking that it seemed like overkill for that application. Anyway, I now know I now know so much more about it, and thanks for the podcast. You guys did an excellent job of explaining all the functions. I have looked at the manual for the device before, and it was a bit confusing. I, cannot, I can now think of several customers who could use something like that for added benefits. Nick. Uh, Another one from Nick is another fantastic episode. Is it official that Mitsubishi Electric will be using R454B? Uh, And that is uh, official. It's been announced for our A2L equipment that we'll uh, we'll have uh, starting at the beginning of the year or probably a little bit after Uh, Residential equipment. Residential equipment will be 454B. And who knows? We may have R32 in the future. We're not married to either one of these. I mean, nothing is permanent. You know, if in my personal opinion, I'm not Mitsubishi, I just my own personal opinion, I wish we'd go to R290, which is propane, which is which is a natural refrigerant, zero global warming, and you know, and they're not talking about a whole lot. They have these in in Europe. We don't have houses blowing up every five minutes. It's been proven safe. Uh, you know, we, we've mentioned this before on an episode we had Don Gillis on, and he was great. It, you know, we'll put a propane tank right next to our house. 
30 gallon to 30 pound propane tank right next to our house on a grill and think nothing of it. But these things just hold a few pounds and we're afraid <laughs> to kind of do that. But anyway, I digress. And I'm just going to finish with the last email. I'm not sure if I should mention a person's name and company, but you know what? I'm going to. He sent it to us. Uh, I will not mention the competitor uh, mini split that he talks about. So I'm just going <laughs> to leave that blank because I don't want to. I don't want to be. You know, I don't want to be said that we're bad mouthing anybody. But uh, he said, "My name is Chris Rooks, and I work for Blaylock Heating and Air in Brooks, Georgia. We have done blank." For years, and are new to Mitsubishi, I have a large new construction hunting cabin that I have designed and actually ordered the rough equipment yesterday. I spoke with Scott Tallman, by far the best trainer that I've ever experienced, about this build, and he told me about Kenza Cloud, and I'm super excited about remote maintenance tool. This site doesn't have three-phase power, so we're doing a 20 tons hyperheat with 13 air handlers and two 300 CFM loss nays. Will I need an AE200 in addition to the Kenza Cloud? Well, can Kenza Cloud control the loss nay without the need for a separate wall controllers? Good question, because I'm going to throw that at you guys. So the short answer is we don't need the AE200. So the Kenza is able to do all of those things. Uh, we usually will recommend the AE200 just because having the on-site control of those things is always nice. But Kenza is able to do all those things. It's one of the benefits of Kenza is that we can use it as an A200. It's essentially the central controller. We don't need anything additional. And Chris, we're happy that you've come over from the dark side and you see the light. <laughs> um, we're happy to have you as part of our family. And if you have any more questions uh, uh, specifically about Kenzo or anything else, email us and we will forward your email to Ed Blair, who's the Kenzo guru. And one thing Ed has promised is he will answer every email. So well, we can always forward it to him and, and he'll reply back directly to you. I did just want to add one more, if you don't mind, just because okay. I thought of it at the same exact time. And when I saw this fan mail came in, uh, I kind of got a chuckle out of it. It was Nick again. And he said, I don't know why, but when Scott was describing the icon for maintenance data, he said it looks like a bag of nickels. So we talked about it on a previous podcast that we now, with the version 5.5 maintenance tool, we no longer have to go back to our system info to see the maintenance data. Yeah, It looks good. nothing like a bag of nickels. If you look at the top of the screen, it looks like a coin stack is what I call it, mm -hmm. or even what he said, it actually looks like a stack of nickels, which is a much more accurate description. If I only had the verbal cue of bag of nickels, I would never find <laughs> that, that icon. So stack of nickels is a much better uh description of what that is now what i can't figure out is what are we trying to represent with that stack of nickels <laughs> i have no uh, idea it, it's one day it's just gonna be like a light bulb just going on oh my god i now i know what it, now i know what you're, it prob you're probably right because uh when you go to leave the screen on maintenance tool and there's just a green man running the running yeah. man he's the running, running man. out the door yes yeah, well, that's how you leave yeah. that makes that's total exit. sense yeah. i just Return. Why is he running so fast? That's return. He's returning <laughs> no, that's from wherever he's no, coming that's from. Exit. In a he's hurry. Leave. He's yeah. running. He's getting the heck out of Dodge. So I think that's it for our fan mail or email. I mean, we didn't read every single one of them. The nasty ones I left out. They were all about you anyway. I know. That's, they were all from me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> about me. It's you know, it's one of my many personalities. But I want to thank everybody who who uh, took the time to send us fan mail or or an email. We we truly. And sincerely appreciate you listening to us and that you care enough uh, to send us an email. Uh, and, and we've gotten plenty that we didn't talk about. Uh, a lot of them. I remember when we talked about uh, a brisket, smoking a brisket, we did fat side up and fat side down. That was like the most controversial thing we could have talked about. Yeah. I think we'd better, yeah. been better off talking about politics. <laughs> really. Yeah. Well, what I ended up finding those. out is fat side up, fat side down. It all has to do with the grill you have. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say fat side up is the way to go because it depends on the grill. Yeah. So the next time um, we get enough fan mail or enough emails that come in where we can put another episode together, we will. Uh, reminds me a little, uh, I feel like a little bit like the guys from Car Talk, you know, the Click and Clack Brothers, you know. I'd love to do a live episode and get some phone calls in there, but that may be one of those things. Be careful what you wish for. There'd need to be like yeah. a 15-second delay on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Well, we could we could just set a specific time. Hey, call us, and uh, we'll we'll edit everything out and then yeah. put it out there. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, thanks again, everyone, and, uh, and take care. Yeah. yeah, we'll see you on the next one. All right. So, um, you know, one of the worst 
things that ever happened to me. So my first, my first job in the industry was, was building cascade systems. And my second job was actually, I worked for Sears repairing appliances. And I know Bryn, you mentioned Papa Gino's yeah. earlier. Uh, true story. This is a long time ago, probably before you were born. And I went into a Papa Gino's and I had a, a sub, an Italian sub, and I had my drink. I walked out to my van, probably parked 100 feet away. And I got to my van. I wasn't feeling good. I walked back in to Papa Gino's. I went to the restroom and and uh, got sick. Oh, no. Sick to my stomach. Something I ate didn't agree with me. And mm. uh, that was the very last time I've been in a Papa Gino's because <laughs> I, I have that memory. It's like okra. Um, I, my wife bought okra one time, and I put it in a soup. I made a – it wasn't jambalaya. It was something else, another one of those Cajun-type dishes. I can't think of what it was, but it had okra in it. Both my wife happened to get a bug, nothing to do with the food at all. We happened to get a bug the very next day, both of us, and we were very sick to our stomachs. Haven't been able to eat okra since. Hmm. I was actually thinking about it. When I used to be in a van, it was like every morning, if you go to the Cumberland Farms, it was like every HVAC company's van was yeah. out in the parking yeah. lot. You yeah. go and get your roller sausages or oh, coffee and all that stuff in the good morning. Good Lord. They had those like French toast wrapped... Yeah. Sausage, maple sausage, so good. Yeah, Seven Eleven belly bombs. Don't get the favorite. taquitos. No, no. When I was You'll single, be burping those up. Oh no, <laughs> you'll be tasting those forever. But when I was single, I used to get the belly bombs on the yeah. way home. Right, and these are frozen chili cheese dog with onions. Right, and you microwave them there, you know, and then you eat you eat two of those. Let me tell you something. They call them a belly bomb for a reason. <laughs> yeah, they were. Well, actually, they weren't good.